get started, um, I know there'll be some trickling in uh, in a few minutes. Um, my name is Linda Snetzlar, and I am the Associate Provost of Outreach and Engagement at the University of Iowa, and I want to welcome you to the Hawkeye Lunch and Learn today. Um, this is a, a very special occasion because we have President Sally Mason with us. She's going to be telling us about important pieces of our university history. Um, but what she won't tell you, and so I'm going to do that, is um, some of the tremendous leadership kinds of things that she has done, um, both that affect the state, but also um, our University of Iowa. Uh, Sally became the 20th president of the University of Iowa on August 1st, 2007. And she is, and some of you may not know this, a trained cell developmental biologist. And so she holds a professorship in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences um, at the University of Iowa. Um, currently, she is overseeing an era of campus transformation. And, and if you've been to our campus, you will be able to see all of the kinds of things that are going on in terms of construction. Um, she has overseen a lot of what is going on in terms of rebuilding relative to um, the flood of 2008, which was a major, major disaster uh, and has uh, required a great deal of work that continues over years. Um, also recently, um, we are seeing the construction of the state-of-the-art children's hospital and biomedical discovery center at our university and a brand new residence hall. And we haven't had a new residence hall since about 1968. So that also is a, a marvelous addition. I, I have watched firsthand um, President Mason's uh, work with students. Uh, and some of that, I think, reflects the fact that she's the daughter of an immigrant farmer and the first child in her family to attend college. Under her leadership, um, we've had incredible success in terms of things that students have done relative to increasing enrollment and student retention. And that's incredibly important as we look at um, our student population and, and what they can achieve on our, on our campus. One of the things that Sally has done, which I think is incredibly important, is a two-year tuition freeze. This was her idea, and um, it has been really um, a, a wonderful situation for undergraduate students for the past two years. And this was really the first freeze um, in about a 40-year period, so that also has been wonderful for our Iowa students. On a personal note, um, I have worked with Sally as president of the Faculty Senate at my institution. And one of the things that um, I think sets her apart is that she is willing to talk with, collaborate with not only faculty, but also undergrad student leadership, grad student leadership, and staff um, at our institution. And what happens when that occurs is that when there are policy changes or changes of any kind on campus, everyone is working together to achieve those changes. And so that, I think, is a wonderful quality of, of true leadership and um, has meant a great deal to me as, as I have worked on campus. So it's my great pleasure at this time to introduce to you the University of Iowa President, Sally Mason. for that very, very kind introduction. I think I'm turned on. I have more microphones attached to me right now than uh, I probably need. And I do appreciate all of you spending your, your lunch time with me this afternoon. Uh, this is going to be a little different for me. I'm, I'm, uh, as I told uh, Linda and Laura this morning, I, I was used to lecturing to freshman students for about an hour and 20 minutes twice a week for 20 years. So I can talk for a good long time if I need to. But it's been a long time since I've actually filled almost an entire hour with comments. And as I look through my notes last night, I have a lot to say about your university for Iowa. I, I am thrilled, actually, to be here and be able to talk a, a lot today about the history of our great university and some of the things that we have to look forward to. 
Over 165 years ago, a new frontier state sparked a vision of public higher education that would be accessible to everyone. When Iowa was only 59 days old, the pioneering first General Assembly in 1847 established the State University of Iowa, SUI, that's why you still see that sometimes, as one of their very, very first acts. Imagine a state with that kind of forward thinking and forward looking vision that education, especially higher education, would be such a high priority for them. Now what we know today is the University of Iowa came into being as the new state's first public university. Our university was founded with the express purpose of providing teachers for the new state schools as well as professionals for the state's economic and cultural development. Not surprisingly, we still do all of those things today in a greatly expanded version of what that original vision was. The University of Iowa began with a handful of faculty, one building, and a few dozen students. Today, looks a little different. We are a world-class, multifaceted enterprise with over 30,000 students. And this is a wonderful view of what uh, our Iowa City campus looks like today, although I don't see any tower cranes in this picture, so I have to, there's something wrong here. Um, we have a lot of construction, as many of you know, going on in Iowa City. We conduct groundbreaking research in many, many areas for the betterment of all society. We pursue creative endeavor that the whole world recognizes and is inspired by. And we're engaged with our community and state, making life better for all Iowans in ways our university founders probably never dreamed of back in 1847 when that original idea came to life. Although today's University of Iowa is worlds beyond the modest beginnings of that mid-19th century institution, the core purpose of our university has never changed. We were conceived as, and we will remain, a public state university, a university for Iowa. I hope you've seen some of the TV commercials that we ran before the uh, election got cranked up. But the university for Iowa is definitely the way we believe we should be viewed. We have a bedrock mission to serve our state's needs and to fulfill our citizens' dreams. We aspire also to world excellence but we do so in the service of the people of Iowa. Our University of Iowa mission states that we are to meet the needs of the people of Iowa, the nation, and the world. And we never forget that first and foremost on that list are the people of Iowa. So today, what I would like to do is touch on a few of the ways that throughout its history, the University of Iowa has always been the university for Iowa, making uh, <coughs> making life better for the people of this remarkable state through its ethic of service and engagement. And I think that ethic is an important piece to keep in mind. The state of Iowa has a long, proud history of recognizing the equality and dignity of all people. And you might be surprised as I go through some of these uh, distinctions for the University of Iowa, you might be surprised at a few of these. The Supreme Court of the Iowa Territory abolished slavery as early as 1930, or 19, 1839. <clears throat> That's remarkable in and of itself. Iowa was a free state from virtually the very beginnings of its conception as a state. Iowa was also one of the first states to eliminate a ban on interracial marriage in 1851. And it prohibited separate but equal classrooms in 1868. This was nearly a century before the U.S. Supreme Court did it in Brown versus Board of Education, also here in the Midwest. Now, in the midst of uh, this forward-thinking social ferment, the University of Iowa played a major role in opening up opportunity to all of its state's citizens. This set the pace nationally at the same time. So we were really, Iowa was really a national leader on this forefront. So for example, when we opened our doors in 1855, we became the first state university to admit men and women on an equal basis. Imagine that. Today, our College of Law is known for its service to all citizens of Iowa. In fact, its citizen lawyer program provides law students with opportunities to engage in pro bono activities, community service, philanthropic projects for a broad spectrum of Iowa citizenry, from low-income clients to migrant workers to older people and to people with disabilities. 
and we're proud and pleased to be able to do that on behalf of our state. But these accomplishments are built on a very long history. Some of the university's earliest social milestones emanated, indeed, from the law school. The University of Iowa was the first public university in the country to grant a law degree to a woman, to Mary B. Hickey Wilkinson in 1873. Now, depending on how you feel about lawyers, you can decide for yourself whether this was a good or a bad thing. But it is a milestone, obviously, in the history of this state as well as in the history of our institution. And Mary Humphrey Haddock of Tipton, an 1875 University of Iowa Law graduate, was the first woman admitted to practice before the U.S. Circuit and District Courts after, and this had to happen first, after the Iowa Code was amended in 1873 to strike out white and male as qualifications for admission to the bar. So that had to happen first, but once it did, we were poised. We were absolutely poised on, uh, and ready to go. Now, our law school was also the first public university to grant a law degree to an African American. That would have been Alexander Clark, Jr. in 1879 from Muscatine, Iowa. So again, lots of milestones. And these are just among the earliest milestones that the University of Iowa has posted in the ongoing fight for serving people of our state from all backgrounds. Now, just a couple of others. In 1895, Iowa's Frank Kinney Holbrook was the first African American to play on a varsity athletic squad. He uh, was both a football player and ran track. And uh, this was the first time this had ever happened at an American public university. So it, this was a national milestone. The University of Iowa is also home not only to the first daily campus newspaper west of the Mississippi, that would be the Daily Iowan, and that was established in 1868, but it also boasts the first female college newspaper, na newspaper editor, which happened in 1907. So lots of interesting and wonderful firsts there. Now Elizabeth Halsey, headed the Department of Physical Education from 1924 to 1955. There was a time when administrators could last a long time <laughs> in their jobs. I won't say anything more than that, but you know. I, I find, yeah, less press, thank you. Maybe that's it, that could be it. Thank you, Jeff, for that, that observation. Um, anyway, 1924 to 1955, I marvel at these 20 year tenures, 20 plus year tenures that individuals had. And she established a pioneering program for its time, believe it or not, that was physical education for women. Um, interesting that uh, uh, it wasn't until the 1920s, beyond the 1920s actually, that that program was first allowed to happen for women. Now following that innovation, and many of you know her, Christine Grant became the first wi women's athletic director at Iowa in 1973, and she became nationally known as a pioneer in gender equality in athletics and served as a consultant for the Civil Rights Title IX Task Force and is a founding member of the Association of Intercollegiate Athletics for Women. These were all very, very notable achievements for the time and unusual, uh, to say the least. Iowa was the first Big Ten institution to promote an African American to an administrative vice president's position. That would have been Dr. Phil Hubbard, who in 1966 became our vice president for student services. If you've ever been to the campus and seen Hubbard Park, Hubbard Park is named in honor of Phil Hubbard. Now during the administration of President Emeritus Sandy Boyd, still active on our faculty, Cecilia Foxley created the University of Iowa's first Office of Affirmative Action in 1972 and served as its first director. She wrote an affirmative action plan that was the first of its kind among Big Ten institutions and in fact served as a model for a number of Big, Big Ten institutions after that. And then finally, the Gay, Lesbian, Bisexual, Transgender, and Allied Union, founded in 1970 at the University of Iowa, is the oldest state university recognized and continuously funded LGBT student organization in the United States. So we believe and have always believed in equality for all people. And that's something that the university holds very, very dear. <clears throat> Iowa also gained fame as the first public university in the country to offer insurance benefits to employees' domestic partners, and that happened back in 1993. Today, it's more or less taken for granted. Um, but it was, it was certainly very different not so very long ago. 
So these are just some of the civil rights milestones that have established the University of Iowa as a pioneer in welcoming and supporting people from all across the social spectrum. This is a tradition that grows out of, and I think it continues to enhance, the social well-being of people all across our state. Now, the University of Iowa has also long been a central partner with the citizens of Iowa in defining the character of our people as well as discovering knowledge about the state for the edification of its citizens. That research thing that we do is actually quite important and significant perhaps in more ways than many of you think about on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, this has been true in scientific realms as well as so social realms, some of which I've just touched on. And uh, if we can go back to the slides, I want to talk about two of our most significant buildings on campus, bear the names of two brilliant public scholars. They're not alive any longer, uh, <laughs> but they certainly uh, have left an indelible imprint on the University of Iowa, Samuel Calvin and Thomas McBride. They were pioneers in studying the natural history of Iowa. At one time in my life, I, I, I thought that I would, would become a natural uh, historian, a field biologist, and I was told women don't do that back when I was thinking about doing it. Um, but I certainly have a great interest in both Calvin and McBride for the kinds of things that they did and the ways in which that impacted our university. Calvin and McBride actually met each other at Lenox College in Hopkinton, Iowa. I can't tell you that I actually know where Hopkinton, Iowa is, but this is where Calvin was an instructor and McBride was his student. Both had an absolute fascination, this I get, for studying the flora and the geology of the swiftly vanishing prairies of the 1860s. If you could imagine we were worried already about the prairies going away back in the 1860s. And these two guys took regular field trips together to explore the state and they collaborated on a number of botanical studies. Now Calvin was brought to the faculty of the University of Iowa in 1873 and then was designated as curator of the university cabinet as well. Not quite sure what that title means, but nevertheless, that was his title. This was the school's collection of geological specimens, fossils, and mounted animals and birds. So if you've ever been in McBride Hall to what today is our Museum of Natural History, you've seen some of the remnants of the work that these two gentlemen did. Now, five years later, five years after Calvin was hired, he brought his friend, Thomas McBride, in as an assistant professor of natural science. Samuel Calvin had a very practical approach to his teaching. He combined his lectures with lab and field work, as well as photography, and very controversial approaches at the time, I might say. Both McBride and Calvin also took very seriously their role as public scholars seeing their subjects of geology and botany as important to both academics as well as the general public. Now Calvin in particular became well known all across the state of Iowa for his public illustrated talks. He had slides and he presented these in all manners of clubs and schools, anywhere that they would open the doors up and let him come and talk and show his pictures, he would be there. Um, Thomas McBride took up that mission and responsibility and he was very enthusiastic as he did so. McBride actually became president of the university in 1914 and was largely responsible for the early development of the university's extension program. And in many ways, it was modeled on Calvin's many travels through the state. So these two gentlemen, it's really hard to separate um, how they did their work independently because they were so closely connected to each other for so many years. Now, McBride was an inveterate public lecturer. He loved to do what I'm doing today. He loved to be out in the public speaking to whomever would listen to him. In 1903 alone, he delivered 60 extension lectures in 50 weeks in communities all across the state of Iowa. Now, remember, this is 1903. So it's not like he could hop in the car and drive over on the interstate and be here in an hour and 15 or 20 minutes. It, it's, uh, it's a little bit longer than that. McBride was a firm believer in promoting the idea of the university as public service benefit to the citizens of the state. And in many ways, this, uh, this kind of lunch and learn that we're doing today, we're participating in what I consider to be the legacy of Thomas McBride. 
Now, while working with the Iowa Geological Survey, McBride became very enamored with the Okaboji Lakes region in northwestern Iowa. If you've been to Lake Okaboji, you can understand uh, the appeal, and you can certainly see why McBride, someone with McBride's interests would find Okaboji extremely interesting. So in 1909, he established the Iowa Lakeside Laboratories there. This is a field station which today is for all three of Iowa State Universities and still offers, even as we speak, summer classes, research opportunities, lifelong learning programs, as well as very, very beautiful grounds themselves which are open to the public. And we even send writers there in the summertime to allow them the luxury of having a very nice setting to continue to do their craft as well. Now, Calvin and McBride are also well known for that great public institution still located on our campus, which I've mentioned, the Museum of Natural History. This is the oldest university museum west of the Mississippi River. Uh, since we're one of the oldest institutions west of the Mississippi River, it's not surprising that we would have one of the older museums. Now, Samuel Calvin eventually convinced the university's governing board to support an extensive excavation trip which yielded a whole lot of geological and fossil specimens for the museum and for student study. The museum thus grew significantly, expanded its scope to exploration of the world as well as the state of Iowa. Now what do I mean the, by the world? Well, perhaps the most well-known project during this time was the Laysan Island Expedition on the Hawaiian Archipelago. Museum director, at that time, Charles Nutting, first visited Laysan Island in 1902, and he was a scientific advisor on a U.S. government expedition to explore the Pacific waters around Hawaii. Now remember, long before Hawaii was ever a state. Uh, these were simply islands out in the Pacific. He decided to recreate the incredible scene for an Iowa exhibit called a cyclorama. So when he came back to Iowa, he wanted everyone to experience what he had experienced and thought the best way to do it would be to create this display. Uh, museum taxidermist Homer Dill led the return expedition in 1911 to actually gather the specimens for the planned 360 degree, 138 foot long cyclorama. And this was the first major test of Dill's new museum studies program. And this was the very first museum studies program in the country. So this was all very pioneering work at the time. The cyclorama drew a lot of students to the University of Iowa and over the next decades many of the future leaders of the nation's museums actually graduated from this program. I spent 20 years at the University of Kansas that has a very very fine natural history museum and much of the history of that museum emanated from what happened up here in Iowa. Now, the Laysan Island Cyclorama opened in 1914. It is unique in museum history. It was the first attempt to recreate an entire ecosystem in an exhibit. And it's the only exhibit of its kind still in existence. So you can still see it today on the University of Iowa campus. When the Cyclorama was opened to the public in 1914, William T. Hornaday, one of the world's great naturalists and director of one of my favorite zoos growing up, the Bronx Zoo, reported that the largest and by far the most spectacular of all the world's habitat groups of birds is to be seen right here at the museum in Iowa City. Now this year we're engaging in a centennial celebration of the renowned and restored Laysan Cyclorama. So next time you're in Iowa City, stop by McBride Hall, take a look. It's quite interesting. I will tell you that school children from all across the state visit the museum every year, along with thousands of other visitors from Iowa's communities and beyond. And they enjoy learning and uh, seeing the historic displays about our state, as well as the larger world, because this really does give you a sense of some of the things out beyond the borders of Iowa that are right here in Iowa City as exhibit innovations that we can bring to the public. Now what else are we doing? Well, uh, the Biosphere Discovery Hub, which investigates the complex relationships between culture and the environment. We're even taking the museum on the road. You might have seen the Mobile Museum. If you were at the State Fair this year, um, if you were on Ra Ragbri this year, if you um, 
Oh, when we were up at Okaboji, it was there. It seems to, to stalk me, so it follows me. I'm surprised it's not parked out front today, but I think because they're having the, uh, yeah, the combat hunger campaign out there today, the Mobile Museum must have stayed home. But it's, uh, it's an incredible example of ways in which we can bring some of what we do at the University of Iowa out on the road rather than having people simply come to Iowa City. Our educators and curators can combine mobile museum visits with education programs or speaker visits for any age group or event. So if you want to have a birthday party for your kids or your grandkids and you need the mobile museum to come on over and participate, we probably could arrange that for you. I think I just volunteered that, so you better tell somebody. <laughs> How much does it cost? We could probably make it very, very inexpensive, especially for you, Jeff, okay? You want Joe driving? I don't want Joe driving, so. But thank you. We have, we have professionally trained drivers. Thank you very much. Um, but anyway, thanks to the public sensibility and the spirit of Calvin and McBride, the University of Iowa has long been able to bring natural sciences and the understanding of our home ecosystems as well as those around the world to the people of the state of Iowa. And we're very obviously proud of that. So I'm going to switch gears now. I'm going to talk about uh, just a couple of other scientific kinds of achievements that uh, we have had during our history. We're very proud of a number of them. And one in particular, next to the Iowa River sits the C. Maxwell Hydraulics Laboratory. Now, as you might imagine, this did flood. Uh, in the summer of 2008, but it's been fully uh, restored and brought back to life. This is the home of our renowned IIHR Hydroscience and Engineering program in our College of Engineering. We have one of the foremost hydraulics groups in the world, right at the University of Iowa. So today, important programs, not surprisingly, the Iowa Flood Center resides in this building. How appropriate is that? Um, and. Uh, that flood center is helping Iowa communities and, and actually other communities as well understand, monitor, prepare for, and manage flood risks. And we certainly have seen plenty of flooding in Iowa, certainly during my seven plus years here now. But Iowa's work in hydraulics, which is now, as I mentioned, world renowned, has a long history of research and practical service that has benefited Iowa communities for many, many decades. In the 1920s, as automobiles became more and more accessible to all kinds of people, and highways were cropping up in response, some of the first research funding at the hydraulics lab was looking at how to develop culverts to mitigate flooded and washed out roadways. So that's probably some of the earliest research that had great relevance uh, all across the state. Now we take clean water in our homes for granted. Um, we have the IIHR to thank for some of that. In the late 1930s and 1940s, the Hydraulics Laboratory became the official testing center of the National Plumbing Laboratory, and they were studying how to keep our indoor water clean of pollutants and separate from wastewater. So again, we do. We take all that for granted, absolutely. And yet it's research that was done at the University of Iowa that allows us to take it for granted today. When water pollution became a national environmental concern in the late 1960s and 70s, the hydraulics lab studied thermal pollution that was created by steam electric power plants, which water pollution regulations had not considered prior to that. So groundbreaking research in areas that uh, have become relevant, certainly, as a result of the research going on here. Now, another one of our strong scientific areas of, nas of national and global importance is the exploration of outer space. Now, this isn't necessarily something people think about every day, that Iowa would be such a key player in outer space. But James Van Allen, this year we are celebrating the 100th birthday of longtime UI professor of physics, James Van Allen. He passed away, sadly, in 2006. One of the great regrets I have is that I didn't make it to Iowa soon enough to know James Van Allen. The highlight of Van Allen's long and distinguished career was his use of UI-built instruments that were carried aboard the very first successful U.S. satellite, Explorer 1, back in 1958. Um, what this did, of course, was allowed him to discover bands of intense radiation. These became known as the Van Allen radiation belts. 
If you were like me as a kid in the 50s and 60s and you liked really bad science fiction movies, you knew about the Van Allen radiation belts because they were talked about as scientific breakthroughs of the time. These surround the Earth. And it came, um, these discoveries came at the height of the U.S.-Soviet space race and literally put the United States on the map in the field of, of space exploration. Uh, it actually finally gave us a leg up for all of those who at that time were worried about Sputnik and the ways in which the Russians were getting ahead of us in terms of uh, space exploration. Fortunately, James Van Allen put us back in the race. Now, despite that major scientific milestone and Van Allen's many subsequent achievements and international awards, the, uh, this man, the distinguished professor, often said that among his proudest accomplishments was teaching students, especially the numerous undergraduates who enjoyed his classes. And we have a very strong tradi tradition that continues today, probably more undergraduate physics majors than I've ever experienced at a research university in my career. Uh, and it's a proud moment to see how many of these young people are actually Iowans following in the footsteps of Jim Van Allen. In a February 2004 interview, not too long before Jim passed away, he said, and this is a quote, I taught general astronomy for 17 years and it was my favorite course. That says a lot about the man and it says a lot about the ways in which he contributed to the university. Not only did generations of Iowans benefit from the brilliant teaching of Jim, but they also had a superb role model, a small town Iowa boy who developed his talents and made an international and in fact an interstellar career right here at home. He was born in Mount Pleasant. Van Allen was valedictorian of his high school class in 1931. I'm not sure how many people that was, but nevertheless, he received his bachelor's degree in physics, summa cum laude, from Iowa Wesleyan College and then his master's and his PhD degree from the University of Iowa. After doing some research at the Carnegie Institution of Washington and the Applied Physics Laboratory at Johns Hopkins University, as well as serving in the Navy, Van Allen became professor and head of the University of Iowa Department of Physics and Astronomy in 1951. And, and, and once again, a very long tenure. He held this position until he retired from teaching in 1985. He, uh, continued to be active even after that, regularly coming to his office nearly up until the time he passed away. James Van Allen remains a true Iowa icon, a representative of what people from our state can accomplish and what we can teach each other both in the classroom as well as in our communities. Now scientists such as Calvin, McBride, Van Allen, all shared their knowledge about not only the larger world around us but also helped define who we are to the people of the state. The University of Iowa has long been a major leader in doing much the same thing in the arts and letters as well. So let me turn my attention now from the sciences, the early sciences especially, to arts and letters. A great current example is uh, Marilyn Robinson from our Writers Workshop. Marilyn continues today to garner national and international renown for her novels and essays. Her most recent novel, Lila, was a finalist for the National Book Award. Unfortunately, she didn't win last night. But to be a finalist, to be one of only a handful of novels named for this prestigious prize is once again a tribute to Marilyn's talent. Now, she, uh, her current fame centers on a trilogy, and Lila is actually the third piece of the trilogy. The novels Gilead, which you see here, one in the middle called Home, and now Lila, explore the history and character of a fictional small town here in Iowa called Tabor. Robinson herself has said that Gilead is based on the real town of Tabor, Iowa, located in the southwest corner of the state, well known for its importance in the abolition movement. And she has brought Iowa to international attention because, uh, as you can see, Gilead won the Pulitzer Prize, and the National Book Critics Circle Award, and uh, Home won the Orange Prize for Fiction. Lila was, again, a finalist for the National Book Award. Uh, didn't win, but there'll be some other awards along the way that Lila might likely win. We'll see. Marilyn is a wonderful example of a long University of Iowa tradition of defining our state through the arts and letters, as well as bringing world-class artistic works to the people of the state of Iowa. Uh, no doubt the most well-known 
A uh, historical figure in this area is someone who is probably familiar to most of you in this room, and that's Grant Wood. He was born on a farm near Anamosa, grew up and conducted an art and teaching career in Cedar Rapids, and then taught at the University of Iowa from 1935 until his death in 1942. Now, he taught at the University of Iowa. This was actually a, a bit unusual. When the University of Iowa hired, hire, hired Wood, um, and he's a very public-spirited figure, uh, he had been director of Iowa's Public Works of Art Project, and that allowed him to create murals for public buildings that emphasized Iowa life and values. So his art very much reflects the kinds of things that he enjoyed doing not only as an artist but was paid to do uh, during most of his life. And perhaps no figure has defined the image of Iowa more than this individual, Grant Wood, and at the same time, he garnered an international reputation. When he arrived on campus, the university had already established itself as a center of a very important regionalist movement in the arts and letters. So he was a really perfect addition to our faculty at the time, although highly unusual to have a painter without a, quote, terminal degree on the faculty of the University of Iowa. Now, um, let me go back to that regionalist movement in the arts and letters. Uh, another important figure, John T. Frederick, a Corning, Iowa native, an alumnus of the University of Iowa, and I think we have a slide of him. He taught English at the University of Iowa in the 1930s, bringing with him the influential literary journal that he edited called The Midland, a magazine of the Middle West. Prominent critic of the time, H.L. Mencken, called this perhaps America's most important literary magazine. Imagine that. With the likes of Frederick and Wood on its faculty, both of whom brought a public sensibility to their work, the University of Iowa was central to codifying and communicating an, an Iowan and Midwestern identity to the general public, as well as to the academic and arts worlds. So we were setting standards for these kinds of things for many, many years. Grounded in the people of our own soil, figures like Frederick and Wood were also prominent in the broader emphasis on the place of creativity in our citizens' lives and in the academic world. Now, while Grant Wood was admittedly embroiled in much controversy, he seemed to have a knack for that, uh, within the art school especially, over the debate between modernism and realism, he was also a part of, of something at the time known as the Iowa idea. The Iowa idea is what ultimately gave rise to something very significant in the world of arts and academics. And that was uh, eventually an MFA degree. The very first MFA degrees were a part of all of this and, in fact, originated at the University of Iowa. Uh, one of Grant Wood's students, Elizabeth Catlett, in 1940, and I believe we have, yeah, okay. Catlett became the first student to receive an MFA in sculpture at the University of Iowa School of Art and Art History, influenced by Wood, because what Wood did for her was simply to urge her to work with the subjects that she knew best. And for Catlett, what this meant was African American people, and especially the state of black women in our society. And that's what much of her work represents. And she's quite well known. Much of her work is still in major museums all over the country today. And she is an alum of the University of Iowa. And then, of course, the artistic innovations of the University of Iowa Founded in this period led Peggy Guggenheim to choose the University of Iowa as the home of Jackson Pollock's groundbreaking painting, Mural. This is widely recognized as perhaps the most important American painting of the 20th century. That was exactly the way it was described when it was recently shown at the Getty Museum in California, where we were able to have the museum fully restored. Uh, what a wonderful opportunity that was. Well, Guggenheim identified Iowa as having one of the most forward-thinking and advanced arts programs in the country. Mural came to our collection in 1951. There's some backstories there that are kind of interesting, too. She had, a, she had a, uh, a thing for the then director of our art and art history program. So what can I say? <laughs> you get these paintings however you can. <laughs> Thousands of Iowans have enjoyed and been inspired by this remarkable work of art, 
uh, when it was housed, certainly in our Museum of Art. Since the flood displaced us, and we still don't have a Museum of Art, at least not yet, we have uh, had the opportunity to display this painting much more widely. It's been on display at the Figgy Art Museum in Davenport. Um, after some incredible restoration work at the Getty Museum in Los Angeles, uh, Mural came back and is back in, in Sioux City at the Sioux City Art Center right now. It made a stop here in Des Moines not so long ago on its way out to California. So we're very, very pleased, obviously, that we're able to share this work of art. Uh, and I think it may be safe to say that more Iowans have seen Pollock's original painting than any other people in the world, although it's about to go on a world tour. So we may, we may be changing that dynamic before too long as well. Now, I did mention um, Elizabeth Cass Catlett's Master of Fine Arts degree just a few moments ago. We were the pioneers of that very degree, the MFA. And it's a, it is the terminal degree for artists and musicians today, not surprisingly. And it was invented right here in Iowa. Now, the, um, most of our, many of our well-known MFAs come out of our world-renowned writers' workshop. So let me say just a few more words about that. Although the workshop was created in the 1930s, the program was brought into its own by then-director Paul Engel. And I think we have a picture of a very young Paul Engel. This is another exemplar of an Iowan who helped establish our state's identity through, um, through art and also brought the world to Iowa. Oh, is that, I think, can you, can you go back one? There we go, there they are. Engel was born and raised in Cedar Rapids and his literary imagination was shaped by a life in a small city and on the family farm outside of Marion, Iowa. He's an alum of Coe College and the University of Iowa and he became director of the Writer's Workshop in 1941. His own work, such as his autobiography, which is A Lucky American Childhood, and his poetry, like Grant Wood's, gave voice to the life and the character of Iowa. In his 25 years directing the workshop, Engel helped define for the world what it means to teach creative writing, and he invited such notable writers to teach at the University of Iowa, like Robert Lowell, John Berryman, Kurt Vonnegut, and many others, and they in turn taught people like Flannery O'Connor, Philip Levine, Don Justice, and the list goes on and on. It truly is a remarkable, remarkable legacy. In 1967, Paul Engel and his future wife, the Chinese novelist Ni Hua Ling, founded the International Writing Program. And in fact, that was, the, uh, that was sort of the, 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 the capstone to Paul Engel's career was to create the International Writers Program. Currently, that program is under the direction of Chris Merrill and continues to bring writers to Iowa City from all around the world today. We've had more than 1,400 international writers over the many years that this program has been in place from over 140 countries spend six to eight or more weeks in Iowa City benefiting not only from that visit, but adding tremendously to the diversity that we have in our community as well. We've had the opportunity through the International Writing Program to have, and we didn't know it at the time because they hadn't won it, but we have had two Nobel laureates that have been part of the International Writing Program that are alums um, of the University of Iowa as a result of participating in that program. And that's just in recent years. So we're very, very pleased about that. The writers have time and space to work on their writing. They also get to learn about life in our country and in our state. So imagine coming to Iowa City as your sort of point of contact with the United States. It's really quite an interesting experience for us as well as for the writers. Now thanks to the efforts of Chris Merrill and many other talented people, Iowa City, as you may know, has been designated a UNESCO City of Literature. And we're still the only city of literature, UNESCO City of Literature in North America. We're very proud of that, that designation. We've been proud to be part of the City of Literature organization. This has allowed us to organize a number of events and programs, cultivating literary life, both at home in Iowa City, but for the public beyond as well. And this next slide gives you an example of one of the things that we're able to do. We celebrate Paul Engel's life every, every year with Paul Engel Day. Uh, and the, the governor has actually declared Paul Engel Day an official day, and we're pleased about that. We have an annual essay contest which asks Iowa high school students, sophomores, to write a three to five page essay about an Iowa experience. It's that simple. 
And I've had the pleasure of presenting these awards, which include, uh, in fact, for the winner, the grand prize winner, is one year of tuition at the University of Iowa for when they are ready to enroll at the University of Iowa. And we're thrilled to be able to give a tuition scholarship away, as well as uh, $500 scholarships to the runners-up. And there's usually six or seven runners-up. So what a thrill it is to meet these young. This is this, is, this year's um, a winner, uh, the tall one, <laughs> the tallest one of that group, <laughs> Palin Stream. She's from Bedford Community High School in southwest Iowa. She, her essay was titled, The Trail of Senses That Leads Me Home. It was a lovely, lovely essay about life on a small farm in a small community in Iowa and the ways in which that sort of influenced her life um, over the short number of years that she's been on this earth. And I can't wait to see what she produces as she gets older. Um, the runners up this year, as in other years, hail from all across the state, from places like Clorinda, Council Bluffs, Boone, Spencer. Um, every manner of small community in Iowa has been affected by this lovely opportunity for students to write. And Iowa students of all ages love to write. Thanks to the success of the Iowa Writers' Workshop, Workshop, the University of Iowa has been able to develop many more award-winning programs, including the top-ranked nonfiction writing program that we have in our Department of English, the Iowa Playwrights' Workshop in the Department of Theater, and now undergraduate degrees in creative writing as well that have become very, very popular very quickly. We, uh, we've brought the legacy of our writing expertise to the general public with the nationally prominent Iowa Summer Writing Festival through our Division of Continuing Education. This attracts people from all over the country. It was established over 25 years ago. The program consists of week-long and weekend workshops with very talented professional writers. Enrollment is open to anyone. So all of you who are harboring the idea that you have that great novel inside of you, this is your opportunity to come and perhaps get a little coaching from some who have uh, uh, already written their great American novel. Now we do attract a national audience to the festival. Many, many Iowans fill our summer classrooms and gain experience expressing themselves and their Iowa experience. It's a lot of fun. Summertime at Iowa also offers the Iowa Young Writers Studio, which is a residential creative writing program for high school students and well attended every summer. Now, we're also very proud of the university's partnership with the nonprofit Iowa Youth Writing Project. Uh, on the next slide, the organization's passionate volunteer base consists mostly of UI faculty and students. It brings unique literacy and language arts programs to some of the state's most at risk youth via after school, as well as in school support and mentorship, as well as a very diverse range of extracurricular writing workshops. And we're very pleased about that. And then finally, I'm on the arts side, let me, let me say a few words about the most well-known and publicly celebrated venue for the arts, which is Hancher Auditorium. This is old Hancher Auditorium, which no longer exists on our campus. So if you come expecting to see this, you will be disappointed. Uh, this is a large public auditorium for the arts, which had been in the plans for our growing arts campus since the 1930s. But the uh, realization of that dream didn't take place until about the 1960s and 1970s as the campus was once again expanding. <laughs> President Howard Bowen at the time initiated the project and it was ultimately completed when Sandy Boyd was president, leading to what you see here in this slide, Hancher Auditorium, 1972, named after President Virgil Hancher, who by the way was president when the whole concept of the Iowa idea was hatched. So it's very appropriate that the Performing Arts Auditorium in Iowa City be named after Virgil Hancher. Hancher has brought world-renowned performances to its auditorium for five decades, but uh, an important part of the ongoing Hancher legacy is its many partnerships and programs all across the state. And it's never been truer than now since we haven't had Hancher Auditorium for six years. Uh, along with our Art Share program, Hancher has been our major arts outreach organization since the 1970s, bringing world-class performances and residencies, educational programs to Iowa communities and schools, literally from border to border. Uh, probably the most well-known Hancher partnership that has benefited Iowans and their enjoyment of the arts is with the Joffrey Ballet. Whoops, I think we got ahead of ourselves there. 
the slide, oops, where, you're getting a real preview here. <laughs> but let me go back to the Joffrey Ballet. The renowned dancers first performed in Iowa City in 1974. After their appearance, UI medical professor Dr. Lewis January, notice I said medical professor, um, who was a longtime supporter of the Joffrey, immediately formed the Iowa Friends of the Joffrey. This partnership continues today. His enthusiasm and that of other Iowans led to Joffrey residencies at the university in the 1980s. This included multiple performances in Iowa communities such as Tipton and Dubuque. And since then, Joffrey and Hancher have worked hand in hand with Hancher commissioning new works, premiering the renowned 1967 or 1987 Joffrey production of The Nutcracker and reaching out to the people of Iowa through workshops, performances, residencies and communities all across the state. Now, you got a little preview of this. New Hancher. Uh, we are thrilled, as you can imagine, that uh, this is now in progress. The construction is proceeding beautifully. This is designed, uh, this auditorium was designed by Caesar Pelli, a world famous architect who is noted for designing performing arts facilities. And this is now rising from the ground on our campus in the wakes of the wake of the flood of 2008. In the meantime, Hancher continues its performance, education, and outreach programs, even as we're waiting for this new building to be completed. And uh, come 2016, I invite all of you to come to Iowa City for likely a performance of the Joffrey Ballet as the very first people to come and perform in the new Hancher Auditorium. So I'm going to segue now to the last part of, of uh, uh, what I want to touch on today, and that's uh, health care. I mentioned Dr. Lewis January being critical to the whole idea of Hancher Auditorium. Not surprisingly, our, our medical arts people are very much interested in the performing arts as well. Today, UI Healthcare services, uh, the, the services that we provide um, cover nearly 200,000 days of patient care annually, about a million patient visits in 200 plus outpatient clinics all across the state. If I can have the, if we can get to the next slide. In addition, we have about 150,000 patients that visit our College of Dentistry clinics, which also do incredible outreach programs for low-income Iowans, children, geriat geriatric <coughs> populations in Black Hawk County and Alamakee County and many other loca locations all across Iowa. We're very, very proud of the fact that we're able to provide um, free or very low-cost patient care in so many different locations across the state, especially for dental patients as well as for medical patients. It's highly likely that someone in your own healthcare provider experience has been trained at the University of Iowa because about half of all the doctors in this state had some or all of their training at the University of Iowa. About 80% of all the dentists in Iowa did their training at the University of Iowa and about half of all the pharmacists. So odds are pretty good that if you go to a doctor, a pharmacist, or a dentist, uh, one or more of them did some of their training at the University of Iowa. Now one of the great figures in the history of Iowa medicine is Arthur Steinler. Oops, we got ahead again, that's okay. Um, he helped define our medical campus's public mission. Really an incredible guy. Born in Vienna, he came to the state as a professor at Drake University's College of Medicine in 1910. Don't go looking for Drake University's College of Medicine because it's gone. But uh, back then, when they had it, uh, we were very fortunate, obviously, to attract Arthur Steinler to the state of Iowa. And he would start, in fact, back in 1910, he started coming to Iowa City twice a week to give lectures and clinics in the emerging specialty of orthopedics. Imagine that just being an emerging specialty in 1910. So when Drake's medical school closed in 1913, Steinler became an assistant professor of surgery at Iowa and bringing to Iowa City his vast experience in pediatric orthopedics and beginning his historic rebuilding of the university's medical school and hospital. Steinler was a very early advocate of state-supported health care for needy children and adults. He believed that no one should be denied uh, medical care. In fact, one of the reasons he left his home country was his perception that, as he said, there was nothing but privilege and preference. The working man had no chance. And he wanted something very different 
and came to America to find it. Steinler lobbied the Iowa legislature in 1915 to pass the Perkins Bill, which provided state-funded treatment at the university hospital for, as the bill said, any child under age 16 affected with some deformity or suffering from some malady that probably can be remedied. Many of the Perkins patients were seen by Steinler, whose innovative treatment for clubfoot, scoliosis, and other congenital musculoskeletal defects were quite effective. His success as a surgeon drew not only patients but also attracted clinicians to study under him. Prominent orthopedists such as Ignacio Ponsetti were among the scores who served internships under Steinler. The Ponsetti method today, which is by far the best and preferred treatment for club foot, was something that Ponsetti actually learned from Steinler and perfected. It's a really amazing to see. In 1925, the College of Medicine created the Department of Orthopedics, for which Iowa remains highly regarded and named Steinler as its first chair. And he held that chair for more than two decades, treating nearly 70,000 pa patients, many of them children, at a rate of more than 2,000 patients per year during his mid-career. Now, Steinler also lobbied the, the Iowa legislature for funds to create the original Children's Hospital. Uh, this was in 1919, and this was the first such specialty hospital in Iowa. And today, we're in the process of turning this into a real freestanding hospital. As you can imagine, the new children's hospital is under construction. Now, another major figure in Iowa medical history is Elmer DeGowan, who founded the blood center, the blood donor center at, at uh, the university's hospital in 1938. This was one of the first in the country. It was begun only one year after the opening of the nation's first such center at Cook County Hospital in Chicago. So Iowa was the second blood donor center ever. And as a member of the College of Medicine's faculty, Dr. DeGowan conducted very extensive research. Um, it's, it's really remarkable when you think about the history of these things. During World War II, his research turned to the practicality of applying blood storage and transfusion techniques on the battlefront. Imagine the lives saved because of the work that this man did and pioneered, and that's exactly the legacy that he left behind. Now, I could go on all day about the amazing accomplishments of the talented, dedicated people in our five health sciences colleges, but some of you I know got to get back to work, and we're running out of time. So I'm going to skip ahead. I've got a few more things that I would have mentioned, but I want to go right to the final thing I want to do, if Laura can get to uh, yeah, our video. I'm going to show you just a, it, it's not a long video, but it kind of summarizes some wonderful history uh, about uh, the University of Iowa in the words and voice of someone who is familiar to very many of you. You can see what we're missing here. I didn't get to business and I didn't get to education. And there's some wonderful legacies in both business and education. Um, but I do want to show you the video with Sandy Boyd doing the narration. So let's see if we can cue that up. There we go. huge and we have this small college small town atmosphere that brings people together rather than feeling isolated but it's not just the physical smallness it's the attitude we have of welcoming people and then sticking with them well the university of iowa has been a leader in higher education for over 160 years and it continues to lead our future is our never-ending frontier and we're always moving forward I look around and when I close my eyes, I don't see buildings, I see the people who've been going through this university over time. The campus that I first came here, I could hardly imagine the way it is today. And it's almost difficult for me to reimagine how it was in 1954, 60 years ago when we arrived. It was probably the most underbuilt campus of the Big Ten universities. We had just moved into the first section of a freestanding library. The concert hall was the main lounge of the Iowa Memorial Union, and most everything was on the east side with the exception of the medical school and nursing. People like Van Allen did their great work in a very inadequate facilities. A Lindquist, who created so many tests and made us a national landmark, created these in limited facilities. And that means that there's always something new ahead. It's always what's ahead that counts. 
And so it's important that we always be future oriented. same, but it will feel the same. The spirit is there. We have never lost the spirit. We have a cohesiveness. We are, as I say, a university, not a multi-university. We're all present in one sense, both physically and intellectually, that the spirit is there, and we come together easily. So it's that that I think is the unique nature of this place. Well, it's hard to condense more than 150 years of history into a little less than an hour. You've been a great audience. I appreciate that. I know time is short. I'm happy to stay around afterwards for a few questions. But thank you so much, and I hope you enjoyed this. Happy to take questions, sure. Where is the art museum uh, going to be relocated? The, um, you, you may have seen the, very briefly up there the picture of the brand new music building, which is at the corner of Clinton and Burlington Street. The new art museum will be directly across the street from that, the other corner of Clinton and Burlington Street. Okay, on the east side. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay? Great. The southeast and, side. And yeah. Hancher, where will that be? Hancher is, is where Hancher was, only up the hill, near the Levitt Center. Yeah. Uh, out of the floodplain, <laughs> interestingly enough. Yeah. At least that's the plan. So. What do you uh, mean about the freestanding theater? Um, uh, you know, our, our children's hospital has always been embedded within the larger hospital. It's, it, it's, it's never really been something that... Um, was out there all by itself. And now with the brand new building, and if you've been to Iowa City and you've been to a football game and you've seen the big cranes right outside the football stadium, that's the new children's hospital that's under construction right now. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, state of the art facility, really remarkable how it was designed because we sat down not only with the uh, physicians and nurses and the staff who were working there, but with the families of pediatric uh, patients and ha had them help us design the facilities so that as we treat young patients going forward, the facilities are really there to accommodate whole families. Because uh, we know that young patients, especially if they're there for prolonged periods of time, typically have parents and, or family members with them. And these rooms are all made to accommodate that kind of, of living. So very interesting. Anything else? Well, again, thank you all. We have much to be proud of in a great university here in Iowa that serves many, many people. Thank you so much. Thank you.